but most revealing of all were the various heroic attempts to prove the infectious nature of this disease, using volunteers. All these attempts, made in November and December 1918 and in February and March 1919, failed. One medical team in Boston, working for the United States Public Health Service, tried to infect 100 healthy volunteers between the ages of 18 and 25. Their efforts were impressive and make entertaining reading. We collected the material and mucus secretions of the mouth and nose and throat and bronchi from cases of the disease and transferred this to our volunteers. We always obtained this material in the same way. The patient with fever, in bed, had a large, shallow, tray-like arrangement before him or her, and we washed out one nostril with some sterile salt solutions, using perhaps 5 cc, which is allowed to run into the tray, and that nostril is blown vigorously into the tray. This is repeated with the other nostril. The patient then gargles with some of the solution. Next we obtained some bronchial mucus through coughing, and then we swab the mucus surface of each nares and also the mucus surface of the throat. Each one of the volunteers received 6 cc of the mixed stuff that I have described. They received it into each nostril, received it in the throat, and on the eye. And when do you think that 6 cc in all was used, you will understand that some of it was swallowed. None of them took sick. In a further experiment with new volunteers and donors, the salt solution was eliminated, and with cotton swabs. The material was transferred directly from nose to nose and from throat to throat, using donors in the first, second, or third day of the disease. None of these volunteers who received the material thus directly transferred from cases took sick in any way. All of the volunteers received at least two, and some of them three shots as they expressed it. In a further experiment 20 cc of blood from each of five sick donors were mixed and injected into each volunteer. None of them took sick in any way. Then we collected a lot of mucus material from the upper respiratory tract, and filtered it through mandala filters. This filtrate was injected into 10 volunteers, each one receiving 3.5 cc subcutaneously. And none of these took sick in any way. Then a further attempt was made to transfer the disease in the natural way, using fresh volunteers and donors. The volunteer was led up to the bedside of the patient, he was introduced. He sat down alongside the bed of the patients. They shook hands, and by instructions, he got as close as he conveniently could, and they talked for five minutes. At the end of the five minutes, the patient breathed out as hard as he could, while the volunteer, muzzle to muzzle in accordance with his instructions, about two inches between the two, received this expired breath, and at the same time was breathing in as the patient breathed out. After they had done this for five times, the patient coughed directly into the face of the volunteer, face to face, five different times. Then, he moved to the next patient whom we had selected, and repeated this, and so on, until this volunteer had had that sort of contact with ten different cases of influenza. In different stages of the disease, mostly fresh cases, none of them more than three days old. None of them took sick in any way. We entered the outbreak with the notion that we knew the cause of the disease, and were quite sure we knew how it was transmitted from person to person. Perhaps, concluded Dr. Milton Racini, if we have learned anything, it is that we are not quite sure what we know about the disease. Earlier attempts to demonstrate contagion in horses had met with the same resounding failure. Healthy horses were kept in close contact with sick ones during all stages of the disease. Nose bags were kept on horses that had nasal discharges and high temperatures. Those nose bags were used to contain food for other horses which, however, stubbornly remained healthy. As a result of these and other attempts, Lieutenant Colonel Herbert Watkins Pitchford of the British Army Veterinary Corps wrote in July 1917 that he could find no evidence that influenza was ever spread directly from one horse to another. 